Welcome to our new Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. In this podcast, you will hear the verse-by-verse teaching and preaching of Pastor Kevin O'Connor. You can learn more about our church from our website at windwardbaptist.org. I know you're in Luke 1, but just look at Malachi, and you can see the last words of the Old Testament, and that would be Malachi chapter 4. It's a short chapter. It says in Malachi chapter 4, For behold, the day cometh that, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. And the day that I shall do do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. So they didn't have a prophetic voice, but they had the word of God that God had already given them. Remember the law of Moses. And also Moses said that there's going to come a prophet. When this prophet, and it's in the Bible, it's capital P, When this prophet comes, listen to him. And that's a reference to Jesus Christ. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Someone is going to come. And he's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And this is a reference to John the Baptist. He's going to come before the day of the Lord, which was a judgment time period. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I, I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. When Malachi ends, the world is still under a curse. Jesus Christ is going to take the curse upon himself. That hasn't happened yet. And there are some people that believe that this ends the Word of God. Well, this is not the end of the Bible. We pick it up today in Luke. So Malachi connects with Luke, the gospel we're going to look at today. So look at Luke 1. Also, just just as a side note, in Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I will send my messenger... And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And this is a reference, of course, to John the Baptist. And we also see that in the book of Isaiah chapter 40, that John the Baptist is going to be the next one on the scene. So you know that. He's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. The first one that's going to come from Malachi is not going to be the Messiah. Is going to be John the Baptist. And that is going to be the next part of the story from Malachi. So look at Luke chapter 1. God's story continues to unfold after Malachi in the book of Luke. Verse 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, so Luke is saying that I'm going, to, I'm going to speak to you about things where he's writing to Theophilus and he's talking to him about things that's believed. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now the gospel of Luke is different from the other gospels in a sense. That you have the book of, of uh, Matthew. Matthew He is an eyewitness of the life of Jesus. He was with Jesus as an apostle. So Matthew is an eyewitness, and he writes the book of Matthew. Then you have the book of John. He was, he's an apostle. He's a disciple of Jesus. He was with Jesus during Jesus' ministry. And he wrote the book of John as an eyewitness. The book of Mark is written by John Mark. John Mark, he got converted later on. He ended up traveling with, uh, um, uh, during the first missionary journey with Barnabas and and Saul, of course, remember he quit, and Barnabas wanted to take him on a second missionary journey, but um, Paul didn't want to take him. They, they went different ways, but the, at the end of 
Now, Paul's life, he said, bring John Mark to me, for he's profitable for me into the ministry, where first he said, he's a quitter, I don't want to take him, I can't take him, I can't risk it, but later on he said, he's profitable. So he matured, he changed, he got his life right with God, and God used him to write the book of Mark, and it is an eyewitness account based upon Peter. So Peter dictates this book through John Mark. Mark is an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus through Peter. Now, Luke is different. Luke is a Gentile. He's the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. And you know what? He writes more than anybody else. Now, if Paul wrote Hebrews, which, survey, one survey to crowd? Who thinks Paul wrote Hebrews? No, it doesn't matter. Because we know that Hebrews is an inspired book of the Bible, whether Paul wrote it or not. If Paul wrote Hebrews, Paul wrote the most in the New Testament. If Paul didn't write Hebrews, Luke wrote the most. And then John, and then Paul. Or Luke, Paul, and John. But Luke would, would have been the one to write the most, and he's a Gentile. So Luke is a doctor, Dr. Luke. In these days, if you were a doctor, you were usually owned by somebody as like a slave. It's a little different now, doctors. But back then, if you were a doctor, you, somebody who was very wealthy would have you as their personal physician. And in this case, it may have been Theophilus. He calls him most excellent. He's someone that is a very prominent, noble person. He calls him most excellent. Luke writes the book of Luke. He also writes the book of Acts. In Acts, he addresses him differently. Could be that Theophilus got saved, got converted, and allowed Luke to travel with Paul. Because we know that as Luke is writing the book of Acts, you can tell when he's present because he says, we, we did this, we did that. When he's not present, he, said, he, he uses a different pronoun, they. When they did this, they went here. So he was with them sometimes, and he wasn't with them sometimes, but he traveled with Paul. And so he may have gotten saved and been released by Theophilus, and so he addresses him more on like a same level type. He doesn't call him most excellent in the book of Acts. So Theophilus may have been someone who owned or is a prominent person that Luke is writing the gospel, this gospel to. Now Luke is a doctor. He's a historian. He's a scholar. He's very intellectual. Some people say, not me because I don't know Greek, a little bit maybe, real little bit, that the first few verses of Luke are the highest level form of Greek. It's because he is scholarly. He knows the language. But the rest of it, from I believe verse 5 on through the rest of the book, he breaks it down into um, layman, layman's term Greek because he wants everybody to understand it. And he is a very intelligent person. He's a historian. He's a doctor. He's a scholar. And so he's saying to Theophilus, you know that when I do my research, it's going to be accurate. And I'm getting this information as I interviewed people, eyewitness accounts. I'm putting together this gospel so that you can understand the things that's already been attested to and believed by eyewitness accounts of what happened. It's one of the most awesome of the Gospels. They're all awesome. In fact, in Luke, the word good news is used, I believe, 15 times, and all the rest combined, it's only one time. The book of Luke has a lot of the parables that you and I are real familiar with, like the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. And Luke is a Gospel. He's really trying to impact people so that people can know and understand the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's an awesome Gospel. It's different. Gentile. He's not, he doesn't have first-hand knowledge, but he did all this research, and he presents the gospel, this gospel to us. Verse 3, It seemeth good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So you can be confident to know that these things happen. This, there's a, this is an accurate account of the things that you've already been instructed by. Then he goes into the story. There was in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Now, Herod was an interesting person. When you go to Israel, they'll take you to places. You go to a place like Caesarea. You go to a place called Petra. You go to these places, and they show you all of these, these structures that were, were once there that were built by Herod. And he would do things just to show off. Brilliant architect. I mean, he made aqueducts in Caesarea that they still don't even know exactly how he... To get that... The, the slopes so the water could flow and 
all the things that he did, they still really don't know exactly how this guy ha- was able to do all of this. In Petra, you go there, there are places in Petra that he built rooms over the, um, the cliff. And he did that just so could people be like, how he, how he did that? Well, he could have just built it more further in, but he built it over the cliff and, and, and um, st- is able to stabilize it. It's the things that he did, he had pillars that didn't hold anything up, just so you could see all of these pillars, because the pillars are very expensive. They didn't even hold anything up, just so you can show off. Look at all these marble pillars, all this marble, how we had to bring it. He wanted to have so many pillars, they didn't need that many, so he just brought them anyway. You go to um, Caesarea, and there is a remnants of a fresh water swimming pool, and the ocean is right there. <laughs> and it's fresh water. You want to say, yeah, this is fresh water. And they had jacuzzis. I mean, they had very sophisticated bathhouses. And every, all these Roman cities were always duplicated the same way. So that way, no matter where you were in Rome, you always know what to expect. They had bathhouses. Everything was built pretty much the same. Because of this guy. He was an unbelievable architect. And, of course, he built it. He renovated the, the temple, Zerubbabel's temple. He made it unbelievable. I mean, he, he actually raised up the whole mountain. They show you, in, when you go to Israel, they have all these charts of how the mountain was and how he put all these different supports and different... And all these things to raise it up and put it on a level surface. And he made the temple, I mean, it's magnificent. In fact, there's stones from that wall to that wall that big. And they put them together. They still don't even know totally how he got it from the quarry. When you're looking at it, you can't even get a razor blade in between the rocks. There's no mortar. They're just laid down together and they're still there. And you could tell all the Herodian stones because he put a design on it, almost like his signature. So, you know, yeah, that's my stone. And you can still see him today, all this, the, the building that, the things that he did. But the guy was, he was off. <laughs> he was a very ruthless, bloodthirsty, insecure person. Now Herod, his father was named Antipater. And this guy was, he wasn't Jewish, he was, almost, I mean, he was basically Arab. He was, he was uh, Idumean, he was an Arab, basically, who became a convert to Judaism, supposedly. He ended up becoming friends with um, Rome because, well, he ended up marrying this person. I think this person, I forget her name, but she was very wealthy. And so he had money. So he wanted to, he, he wanted to side with the people in power, Antipater, because he wanted power. So when, when um, Pompey was going to invade um, Israel, he sided with, he sided with, the, with the Romans. He financed their, the war. And so when they won, of course, they're like, oh, this guy's, you know, they, they liked him. So he became a friend of Mark, Mark Anthony. He became a friend of Julius Caesar. And so through that, they promoted him, and they made him the governor of Judea, this guy um, Antipater. So he had a son named Herod. So he made his son, you know, governor of, of um, Galilee. And then later on, he became tetrarch of Galilee. And, of course, and then there was a, a, a war. The Parthians invaded that area of Israel, and he fled to Rome. So Rome said, you know what? You're with us, Herod. So they gave him an army. He went and fought against them and won. So then they made him ruler of the Jews. He became king of the Jews. And then he says, you know what? I want to be called Herod the Great. A little bit insecure. He divorced his wife because he wasn't, he was an uh, Edomite. He was related to Esau, not Jacob. But he wanted to impress those that he ruled. He wanted them to accept him. That's one of the reasons. You know what he did? One of the things that he always would do, uh, or he, he did a lot for the Jews for entertainment. That's sometimes what a lot of the um, politicians will do. Give them handouts, give them entertainment, make them happy, like that. That's what Herod would do. So he made the, he made the temple really nice. He made all of these forms of entertainment for them. He did a lot of things to help them out somewhat, trying to win them over to himself. But one of the things he did first off is he divorced his wife. I forget what her name was. I guess it doesn't matter that much but what her name was. But he marries someone who was in the line of the Hasmonean name. It's almost like if you wanted to be a politician in Hawaii and you, you was from the mainland and you want to be more accepted, so you go and marry one, one uh, Hawaiian wahini last name, Kanaka Vivaole or something like that. So now I'm more local now. <laughs> Something like that. Local values, you know, my family. So he marries someone named Mariamne who was from this Hasmonean um, family. 
you know, this family was very prominent. And so he did that because, so he did, yeah, divorced his wife, married this one, so it could help him politically. So now he had more acceptance. That's the kind of person he was. But he was very insecure. So, you know, if he, if he felt like someone was going to go against him, he'd just kill him. Didn't matter if he was his wife or if he was his son. In fact, some people said that the slaves are safer than his own sons. Because they thought, oh, I saw my son looking at me the other day, and he kind of looked like he kind of looked like maybe he wanted to be the next me. So you know what? I cut his head off. <laughs> uh, he had how many of his children killed? And wives, and I mean, this guy was just off. In fact, when he was about to die, in 4 BC, he died. When he was about to die, he says, on the day of my death, he ordered that they would get all the favorite people of the, of the, the, land, the land, and he, and he ordered that they all be put to death, all these people. He rounded them up, threw them in prison, and says, when I die, because I'm getting close to dying, I want them all to be killed to ensure that there will be mourning when I die. Because he felt like people weren't going to mourn for him because the guy was such a, a jerk, you know. No one's good. They're going to be happy. They're going to be celebrating. But he did this. But when he died, the orders were not carried out because they felt like, what are you going to do? <laughs> so they didn't kill all these people. But the worst thing that he did was when Jesus was born, he said that there was one born king of the Jews. And you know how he felt. Wait, what? Born what? You said what? How old is he? He's about one or so. Okay, all the babies, two, year, two years old and under, all the male babies will be put to death to ensure that that, what he would say, king of the Jews, where he was the king of the Jews, to make sure that baby Jesus is killed. But he could not stop what God was doing. So that's Herod. So it says, There was in the days of Herod a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So here you have Zechariah. And Zechariah is a priest. He is a descendant of Aaron. And David did this because you had a lot of priests and there was only so much jobs to do as far as the real prominent jobs. So what they did was he divided the, all the priests. There was about 20,000 in Jesus' day, about 20,000 priests. Divided them up into 24 courses. So 24 courses, they served two weeks out of the year. It was divided up. Each course, you know, all this 24, they'll serve this time, and then they'll repeat it again, and they'll serve that time. They served one week a year. I mean, they, they served two weeks out of the year. And in a Jewish year, it was 51 weeks. So you had 48, and then you had three weeks that they would all serve because those were the feasts. They all served during those, during those three times a year feasts. So they would serve basically three times a year because you had 24 divided, so it becomes 48, and then you got the three weeks, 51. So that's how they would... That's how they would serve. So these um, priests were divided into courses. Zechariah was of the course of Abiah. That's the eighth course. So he serves in the eighth course. And what they would do, what they would cast lots to see who's going to do the very important things. So there was three lots that they would cast. The first lot determined who would cleanse the altar and prepare its fire. The second lot determined who would kill the morning sacrifice and sprinkle the altar, the golden candlestick, and the altar of incense. So these first two lots were important, and whoever got these lots had to do these tasks of preparing the altar uh, um, and um, killing the sacrifice, sprinkling the blood, getting everything ready, get it, and going to the altar of incense and putting all the incense and all that ready for the important guy's job. His lot was to burn incense. When you, when you come into the, the, te- the tabernacle or the temple, you're going to come to the brazen altar, the brass altar. Then you're going to have the laver where they would wash their feet because the ground was just dirt floor. And then you'd go into the holy place. When you go into the holy place, if you're walking into the holy place, on the right side you have the um, table of showbread. On the left side you have the menorah. So they had to, and it had to stay lit. That's what, that's the, the, the light in there. And it represents, of course, Brother Kevin was talking about the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has been the light of the world. And you have the bread, which pictures Jesus as the bread of all. Everything in the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. When you went in the tabernacle, you're not going to look at the dirt floor. It's just dirt. But you would look up. It would cause you to look into the heavens. And it was a, the, all the coverings in the, in the tabernacle. It caused you to look up. And it was beautiful on the inside. From the outside, badger skin. From the outside, it just, looked, hmm, just doesn't look all that impressive. 
Jesus, when you looked at Jesus, he just was a regular person. He looked like a regular person. It was on the inside, the glories that Jesus had. And so the tabernacle, it speaks of Jesus Christ. When they come into the holy place, you have the, the, the table of showbread, the, the, the menorah, the candlestick. And then as you go uh, closer to the holy of holies, there's a veil. As, uh, um, and on the veil, you have the cherubims. You have that separated, and the cherubims guarded from the holy of holies. And only the high priest could go in the holy of holies only once a year to atone for the sins of the people. He'd take the goat, he'd sprinkle the blood, and as God would look down upon the law that was, had been violated, and he would look and he would sit on the mercy seat, and they would receive mercy because of the blood that was shed, the, the innocent for the guilty. And even though the law was violated, God's people would go free because of the innocent sacrifice that pointed to Jesus Christ. So that was the holy place. So he couldn't go into the holy, I mean, the holy of holies. He could only go into the holy place. But the closest he could get was the altar of incense. So that priest of the two that was selected by Lot, they would go and prepare everything for that guy who would come in. So he would come in, the other two would exit, and he'd be in, be in there by himself. And he's going to offer the incense. Now, when the lots were cast, you were selected to burn the incense. That was like the most privileged thing you as a priest could ever do. And you could do it one time in your life. You may never get to do it. When the lot was cast for Zechariah to burn incense, I mean, he about fell over. Wow, I, I get to do it. The most exciting thing he would ever do in his whole life. I mean, imagine if you, you think something exciting, you know, let's say your favorite team uh, is going to the Super Bowl. And then someone says, hey, I got tickets for you. 50-yard line, perfect seats, box seats, 50-yard line, perfect view, everything. Plus, you get to talk, meet the players and everything, and you get to go and, and, and witness Pittsburgh win their seventh Super Bowl, which would mean they have them more than anybody else. You think, wow, how excited would you be if you got to do that? This is even more exciting because it has to do with what God's They got to burn incense close to the veil. So he is excited about it, that he gets to do this. You go find all the other priests that did it. Hey, what is it like? How, how do you feel? And it explained. Well, oh, this happened. Oh, it's just, oh, it's the most amazing thing. You burn that incense and you smell this sweetest smell. You know the incense that they made? You can get it when you go to Israel. You can, they, they put all the spices together, but they don't put, they leave one out. Because that recipe was only for God. So they'll make it for you minus one spice. Because if they included that spice, then it couldn't be kosher. Because it's only for God. So I went when I bought it some, and I, I had given some out to people. It smells really good. But that one in there is not there. Because only, it could only be for God. So when they would go in there and they would light this incense, they would light it and then a smoke would fill the room. And this smoke pictures the prayers of the saints that goes up to God. So, and then the, this smell would affect the whole room. He was in there by himself. He was in his, in his quiet place, in the holy place, communing with God right before the veil. And, of course, he would get on his clothes. So when he came out, everyone would be like, oh, you smell good. Why? Because he was worshiping. Do you know that when you and I worship, we smell good? Our attitude, our countenance. Why? Because we're spending time with the Lord. When they saw Peter and John and they took knowledge of them that they're unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had what? They had been with Jesus. People know when you and I spend time with Jesus because it affects how we smell. It affects our attitude. It affects our countenance. It affects everything about us. The things that we say, the things that we don't say. Our attitude, our goals, our ambition, our love for souls, our passion for Christ because we spend time with Jesus. The problem that we have, I think, one of the biggest problems we have is we don't spend enough time in the holy place praying to the Lord and allowing our prayers to ascend up into heaven. So, burning of the incense. So he's, he, he got to do that. The Bible says that the, the lot was cast and he was chosen. Zechariah, he's excited. Now, Zechariah marries a woman named Elizabeth. And she was also a descendant of Aaron. She can't be a priest because only the men could be priests. For a, a priest, he had to marry 
an Israelite virgin, but not necessarily one of a priestly family, but to have a wife of priestly origin was an extra added blessing for a priest. That was the case for him. The Bible says that they were both righteous before God, walking in the, this is verse 6, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. They're old. They're past the years, the childbearing years. Now, when you read this, we might not really understand what this is saying, but the rabbis taught if you could not have, if you and your wife, if you could not have children, it was because you were cursed. Now, we know in the Bible that there were some people that were cursed and were not allowed to have children. So they just, that, but that's not what God teaches. That, that does not, you can't say that everyone that doesn't have children is cursed. But they, they did teach that. So here you have this priest who's a godly person who seems to be godly to everybody, but he doesn't have any children. So to people, a lot of people probably would talk about him. Well, Zechariah, yeah, it looked like, he's, looked like he's all that, yeah, but you know him. He don't have any children, so obviously he's cursed. Just like in the situation with Job, Job's friends, they thought, what are you doing wrong, Job, that you are going through this trial? When someone is going through a trial, does it automatically mean that they've done something wrong. I remember one time I was talking to someone, asking them to pray for a pastor who was dying of cancer, a pastor friend of mine who was dying of cancer. And they told me, in fact, his brother Bolin. And, and they, this, this person, I wonder what kind of sin does he have in his life that he's dying of cancer. I said, no, none. He's dying of cancer. You pray for him. No, because, you know, God's going to, would have given him healing. Said, That's a strange, strange, you cannot judge that. And I think, well, you don't think we're all going to die someday? We can just live forever in this body? I don't want to live in this body. I want a different body. This body's all bust up. I mean, I know it don't look that way. <laughs> oh, laughter from the crowd. <laughs> so he, he's not able to have any children, him and his wife. So people think that, oh, no, what's wrong with them? doesn't matter. What does God say about them? You know, we could have a good reputation but still not be right with God. And you can be right with God and people mis, misjudge your circumstances. There could be someone that go, going through difficult circumstances and yet you don't know how godly that they really are. But this priest, this couple, the Bible says that they were both righteous before God. That's what the Word of God says. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances, blameless. They were solid, and yet, I'm sure they wondered about that. You and I can have things happen to us, and we may sometimes wonder about it. Why did I have to lose that child? Why did that happen to, happen to my son? Why did I go through that divorce? Why did my husband leave me? Why did my wife leave me? Why did that horrible tragedy happen to that family? We don't understand it because we live in this world where we're short-sighted. We can God sees the long-term picture. So they didn't have children for a reason. Just like Job, he didn't know what was going on. All he could do is trust God. We don't know always what's going on, but we know we can trust God. We know that the Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. All things work together for good to them that, them that love God. So they're called according to His purpose. And all we have to do is be patient and wait on God. We won't figure it out all on this earth. Some things we're never going to understand. You know, I can see why... Some reasons why my father died on drugs, on crystal meth. But at the time, you're what? Lord, you know, we're ministering to people and helping people. Couldn't my father made it? Couldn't he have changed? And we don't, but now you can see a little bit on this earth. Sometimes you see some things. Sometimes you'll never see it. You might not ever figure it out until we get to heaven. And when we get to heaven, we'll just want to worship Jesus. So he couldn't understand it probably. And what do you think his prayer was? Do you think he ever prayed for a son? Do you think he ever prayed for a child? I, if I was a betting person, if I was to bet, which I don't think betting is good for Christians because of covetousness, but if I was, I would put money down that he prayed for a child, probably specifically a son. They probably prayed for that all the time. Him and his wife, let's pray. Lord, please give us a son. 
We just want a son. People think that we're, that we're wicked, that we're cursed. Please give us a son. Not just for that reason. We want to have a son. And they prayed for that. No son. Now, they're old. Do you think they're still praying for a son? Probably not. It's like, no chance of that now. We're old now. That opportunity is past. So they're probably not even praying for that anymore, right? So it says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, and they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. So that's like a double, double whammy. His wife is barren, and they're old. Verse 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Here you have this guy who people think is cursed, and the lot falls on him to burn the incense. He'd be like, yes. What is it like? What is it like? Man, how are you going to feel? What do you got to do? What is it? Probably excited about it. So it says in verse 10, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So when they would go into the, into the temple, the morning sacrifice began when the incense, the priest who had that lot to burn incense, he walked toward the temple through the outer courts. He struck a gong-like instrument known as the, I can't pronounce that word, Megrifah or whatever. So when they heard that, they would all assemble to get ready to lead the, the, the people that were gathering in songs of worship to God. That morning, walked up to the temple on each side of the priest, the one that was going to offer the, the incense. All three entered the holy place together. One priest set burning coals on the golden altar. The other priest arranged the incense and so was ready to go. Then those two priests left the temple, and the, the priest that was going to offer the incense was left alone in the holy place. And so he would come before the, the, the veil, the thick curtain, where it's, which separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And he would get that incense and put it on the burning coals that were taken from the brazen altar. And he'd put that incense on those coals, a special recipe made only for God. And that smell would ascend into heaven. And it's the first time he got to smell that. Wow. And he was still separated from the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died, the temple was, I mean, the veil of the temple was rent. Now we have open access. They were so excited once in their life to go to that place to burn the incense. And yet we, the Bible says, have boldness to enter into the holy place. We can enter before His throne. That we can ask for, uh, uh, we can ask Him and we can pray to Him in our times of need at any time. In our car, in our room, in the restroom, in the closet, when we're walking, in a quiet place, in a secret place, in public even. And we can go to God before the holy of holies. And offer up our prayers that ascends up into the heavens to Almighty God. And sometimes we just don't take it. I know I don't take advantage of that as often as we should. And we should try more and more to spend more time in that holy place. So he does that. He lights it. It ascends into heaven. And it makes that whole room smell good. And the fragrance gets on all over him. As everyone will be able to smell him the sweet fragrance and then everyone was outside and all the people were praying and you know what they're what they were praying for and there was these prayers that they would pray i try to look at some of these they still have them scripted and what the prayers were but basically they're praying for the coming messiah and so here he is representing the people to pray for the coming messiah having prayed for many years for a son and both these prayers are going to be answered so he's in there at the time of incense <laughs> The worshipers are outside. He's there by himself. Never did this before. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Probably talked to everybody he could about uh, the ones that already had done it. And it says in verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So he's doing this and then, bam! And he was like, ah! (laughs) Nobody told me about that! (laughs) All the people I talked to, nobody mentioned an angel. What is going on here? What did I do? Maybe I should. I mean, mean, am I going to die? 
verse 12, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Verse 13, and the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. My prayer is heard. Yeah, you know what prayer I'm talking about. My prayer about, one of the prayers I prayed most, I don't think he was praying for a son right then. I mean, that's, he's old already. He says, thy prayer is heard. Present tense. Our prayers to God that we made years ago are still heard. It's a present tense thing. See, when we say that God didn't answer our prayers, we can't really say that because God is in the present tense. And, and even what we look at is past tense. He's, that prayer in past tense is still present tense to God. Like it says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of, every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. That's us, saints. These are the, the odors, the incense, the prayers of the saints. Revelation 8, verse 2 through 6, And I saw the angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. See, the, 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 the temple down here is just, it's just a type or picture of the temple up there. The golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. It may seem like nothing happening when we pray but when our prayers are sent up to God they're stored in this bowl that one day at who knows what time it's going to be poured out and it is going to rock our world <laughs> or the world with earthquakes and thunderings and amazing things are going to happen. So what does that tell us? Just keep praying because our prayers are making an impact. It may not be right then when you pray, but doesn't mean that, it, that it's not answered. By the way, no is an answer. But a lot of times it's wait, not yet, because sometimes we can contradict our own self. Lord, I want to get this job, and the Lord doesn't answer. Well, but because before we said, we don't want to have a job that's going to hinder our, our worship with God. We said, Lord, don't ever give me a job that's going to hinder me in my worship of you. And then now I pray, Lord, give me this job, Lord. I need this to, why is not the Lord giving me this job? Because I need it to support my family. And the Lord said, well, because I'm answering that prayer back then. Because this, this job is going to hinder you in worshiping God. So, Sometimes we got to understand he's answering them in his time and his, mo his ultimate concern is for us to be molded and fashioned and made into the image of Jesus Christ. So he says, thy prayer is heard. <laughs> what prayer? You know what prayer. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John. Huh? <laughs> he responds, what you talking about? Come on. Be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. Because he says, look at his response. Oh, look what the angel says. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Joy and gladness. Circumstances can change. My team win, happy. My team lose, sad. My team win, happy. My team lose, sad. My team win, happy. My team lose, sad. I get raised, happy. I lose job, sad. Get a new car, happy. Someone smashed car sat. You know, I me mean, <laughs> gladness can, can go like this, right? But joy is, is a deep, it's a fruit of the Spirit based on our relationship with Jesus Christ, and it is deeper than our circumstances. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. It's based on our walk with Jesus Christ. It's a fruit of the Spirit when we are controlled and filled with the Holy Spirit. Not based on circumstances. But he's, see, he had double whammy before. I mean, they're old and his wife is barren. Now they get double portion blessing. You can have joy and gladness. I mean, your team going Super Bowl. You get a new car, an increase in raise and everything good. And you're going to have joy. And many is going to rejoice at 
your son's birth. Verse 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He's going to be a Nazarite. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord, their God. Now, he, he's a priest. Zechariah is a priest. He knows the Old Testament. He knows Malachi. He knows what these words are. He knows what this is talking about, and he just can't handle it right now. He's saying, this is your son. He's the, he, this is the next prophetic word from God. This is going to be uh, John the Baptist. This is going to be the one that comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is the one everybody is waiting for. This is your son. He's like, nah, can't be. You ever pray for something for a long, 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 long time? And finally answers, God answers, and you're like, nah, nah, cannot be. Cannot, cannot. <laughs> no can. That's what he's saying. No can, no can. He shall go before me in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I guarantee you he knew that that's the last of Malachi. He knew that's the last of him. He's going to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the, father, the hearts of the fathers to the children. Lest, because if that don't happen, curse. Lest I smite the earth with a curse. But now he's coming. The one's going to prepare the way. And this is your son. And here he is. Now prophecy is, is going to continue to unfold. Because now your son, the forerunner, is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. He couldn't take it. <laughs> he couldn't take it. But he just doesn't believe. So you know what? He's muted. If you don't believe, nothing you say is worth saying. So God just said, I'll just save you the, the trouble. Mute. <laughs> See, you ever watch something and it's just not worth watching or not worth listening to? Mute it. Elijah was a man who, was, who called Israel to a radical repentance, and that is what John the Baptist is going to do. Listen to these verses. Matthew 17, 12. But I send to you, this is Jesus talking, that Elias has come already. They knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Matthew eleven fourteen. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He said, if you can understand that John the Baptist is the Elias that was prophesied from Malachi, then you can understand that John the Baptist is Elias that was prophesied, then you can understand I am the Messiah. It was nothing but good news. Verse 18. Whereby shall I know this? How can this happen? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel. He said, I am an old man. I am Gabriel, and I'm telling you what's going to happen. I know, but I'm an old man. But I am Gabriel, and I'm telling you what's going to happen. Don't argue with me. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. I'm here to show you good news. Why don't you want to believe? You ever tell someone good news and they don't believe it? You say you tell somebody that Jesus Christ came, he died for your sins, he was buried, he rose again, so you can make it to heaven if you trust him as your savior and you're giving them good news. I'm like, ah, no. They don't believe. They don't believe the best news of all. Zacharias was getting the best news of all, but he didn't believe. I show thee these glad tidings, and behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. He represents the Jews as a whole in a sense that they have been muted because they did not believe. And not able to speak because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Whether you believe or not, it's still going to be fulfilled. Just like as Brother Kevin is, is teaching on uh, Esther, there's going to, when one of the chapters, he, when he talks about when Esther is supposed to go before the king and she didn't want to go because if he doesn't hold out the golden scepter, it means she's she going to be killed. And so she don't want to do it at first. Mordecai says that you need to go and do this. But if you don't do it, deliverance will arise from another place. God is still going to do his, his will still is going to be done. But you won't be blessed. So that's what he said. It's still going to happen, but now you're going to be muted. After he goes in and offers the incense, what's going to happen is he's in there by himself. He's going to come out and he is going to bless the people. This is what he's going to say. This is his job. They went over this. Okay, this is what you do now. Okay, you understand? Yeah. He didn't, they didn't say anything about the angel and all that, but nevertheless, this is what he's supposed to say. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The ironic blessing. 
And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Well, he says, well, verse 26 is what he said, and, and give thee peace. And then the people are going to respond. Then the worship people are going to come out, like our worship people there, and they're just going to start praising the Lord. So they're all waiting, and he's taking long. Because there's this thing going on there that's not the normal thing. And they're like, hmm. Everyone was waiting outside. The other two priests, they're supposed to join him. When he comes out, they're waiting for that. They're, they're, you all right in there? <laughs> Is that right? You, everything all right in there? But they're just waiting. Because if he messes up something, he could be struck down dead. Brother never tried going to the Holy of Holies, huh? <laughs> He's taking long. You go in there, that's... <laughs> That's instant death. I mean, the high priest, he went there once a year, and some of them didn't make it. So they're like, kind of like, <laughs> do you think, <laughs> we did kind of think they'd never have any children, something, you know, maybe when he got in there, and God was like, hey, you're cursed, remember? You get out of here. He's taking long, and they're like, mm. everyone's praying. They're kind of looking, every bit praying and waiting for, you thinking something's happening. Or, or something's taking too long and you're kind of like, you're kind of looking up like, what's happening? They're all probably doing that. And they're seeing the priest and they're probably talking to each other. What you think? I don't know. Who's going to go get him? Well, not me. <laughs> we should have tied a rope around him. <laughs> we knew he was suspect. He's taking a long time. And finally he comes out. He didn't come out like, usually the priest came out and he's just like, And they would join him, and he would lift up his hands. <laughs> and then he would, he would repeat the ironic blessing. And then the people would shout, yes, God's blessing upon us. And they would start singing. This time he didn't come out like that. Finally, he's like, <gasps> and they're like, well, he get different style. He couldn't talk. <laughs> they were looking at him like, what happened to him? He's talking fine earlier. He can't talk. So now he's like, he's trying to tell him what happened. He has the best opportunity once in a lifetime. His, both the prayers have been answered that he is going to have a son and the Messiah. He's going to be the forerunner to fulfill Scripture. That the Messiah is coming and he's going to come out there and announce the blessing upon the people that they have been blessed. And I am having a son and I am excited. But he doesn't believe so he has nothing to say. Let that not happen to us. That we don't believe so therefore we have nothing to say. But when we spend time with Jesus and we believe what he's doing and we trust in him, we have a lot to say. We have a testimony about what happened to us. We should be walking around like how he's supposed to have been, coming out there like we're 6'5", with the biggest blessing to tell everybody, and our countenance is radiating where they kind of, kind of where the reflection off of our countenance is so bright, it almost, it, it's almost alarming, like how Moses was. And we have such a glowing countenance because of what Jesus has done in our life and the opportunity that he has given us to burn incense before the holy place, to go to pray before an almighty God and approach His throne that we could receive grace to help in time of need and we can talk to Jesus, we can have our prayers answered, we can see Him work in our life, we can see the fact that we're new creatures in Christ and we can go out there and we can tell the world about Jesus Christ. But sometimes we don't believe. So we're muted and we come out and then we're just talking. What happened? Nothing to say. Why? Because I don't believe. It's not that I'm not a believer. It's not that I'm not a Christian. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I'm not feeding myself with the Word of God. I'm not worshiping God. I'm not in the Word of God. I'm not praying to God. So therefore now, I start, my, my belief becomes weak. And so now I have nothing to say. And the most exciting thing is happening. Now he's going to have to wait. And then he's going to, when it's fulfilled, and he's going to write down his name, and guess what it's going to be? We already talked about it. John. Dude, John, why don't name him Junior? The angel said, John. John. Then, boom, he can talk now. Now he says, okay, now. You know what he did, though? As God started working on him, 
you're going to have a son. You know what he did? He went home. He said, Elizabeth. What he say? We're going to have date night. Yeah. And she said, Zachariah, how come you are shaving? How come you're putting on some cologne? You got the incense all over you. It smells good enough. He started to exercise his faith because I guarantee you this wasn't no miraculous conception the same like Mary's. So he had to get together in sexual intimacy with his wife and she conceived. He started to get it. And then when they had a child and he wrote down the name, we'll look at that as we go through this. He writes his name down, John. You know how significant that name is? Do you know how significant this hall their names are? Because his name is Zechariah. And you know what that means? You know already, right? God remembers. 400 years of silence. God never forgot. A lot of the Jews forgot. God never forgot. He marries a woman who's of the priestly line of Aaron, and her name is Elizabeth. You know what her name means? His covenant. Them together, and they come together in sexual intimacy. God remembers his covenant. They have a child, the grace of God. That's what John means. And God did all that through him, even though he did not even believe. And then he got with the program. So let us get with the program. God never forgets his covenant. He's not forgot that he's coming back for us. He remembers that. Let us let our hearts not be troubled. He's coming again. As we celebrate his birth, let us not forget. Let us not be unbelievers in a sense of forgetting what this season is all about. What everything of our life is all about. It's about Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. The good news that he was given is the good news that we have. That Jesus Christ saves. He came to this world to be born in a humble way, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise up again, to ascend into heaven, to sit down at the right hand of God, forever to, ma- to make intercession for us. You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.